Good evening, and welcome to Dimensions of Prophecy. Our presentation this evening is entitled, The Object of the Devil's Attack. There's something the Antichrist and the Devil have been trying to do away with ever since the beginning of time. It's terribly important that we understand this, because it helps us put together some important subjects we'll soon be talking about, such as the Mark of the Beast. I encourage you to listen attentively as Pastor Kenneth Cox explains this important topic from God's Holy Word, entitled, The Object of the Devil's Attack. Chapter 2. Welcome each of you back again this evening. We're living in a time in which most of the things that we have held sacred, things that we believe that was unmovable as motherhood itself. We're living in a time when those things have been thrown to the wind. People have passed them by. They feel like that that's something of the past, that today we're not uh, required to be guided or directed by that. And thus we find that as a result, we're reaping a whirlwind today because the principles, the objectives, the standards that many of us have been raised with have been thrown out, no longer believed in, passed by. In fact, I even hear ministers standing in pulpits telling people that the law of God has been done away with, that it doesn't have to be followed, that you can not pay any attention to it, that it's something of the past. And as the result, we find that many people are groping, not knowing where to turn to, what to do, because they don't know what to get their hands on. They've taken the law of God and have trampled it underfoot, deserted it, and we find that the commandments that were taught us, that we believed, have been changed completely. For instance, you take the simple commandment that says, the first one, tells us here, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. And we say, well, we keep that one. Uh, we, we certainly keep that one. We don't have any other gods. And I really wonder if maybe as people in this country, if we don't have more gods than anybody else. Uh, you know, what about the gods like uh, amusement, the gods of uh, pleasure, the gods of entertainment? I wonder if we're more concerned today about being entertained than we are worshiping the Lord. And you know the second commandment that simply says, Thou shalt have no other gods before me, and thou shalt not make unto thee any graven images. And you say, well, <laughs> uh, we don't have any gods like that. We, we don't worship gods like that. Well, did you understand that over 50% of the world does? And the thing that bothers me is over 50% of the world worships gods like this. And Christ gave a commission and said, this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world. And I really wonder what we're doing with it. And the third commandment, that simply says, thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. And I could talk a long time on that one and I'm not going to. You know, there's a lot of ways of taking the Lord's name in vain. I'd like to deal with just one, and that's profanity. You know, I can remember when if a man used profanity, he was looked upon as being uncouth. You never heard a woman use profanity. That was just unheard of. And today we're living in an age when men and women both use it. They use it openly. It's in the newspaper, it's on TV, you hear it on the radio. If there's one thing that I can credit Hollywood with, that is wrecking the language of the American people. They've done a good job with that. You know, I don't know about you, but when I was growing up, my mother had a way of stopping it. And I mean, it worked. I don't know if you've ever had your mouth washed out with soap, but it will stop it, I'll guarantee you. 
But we have, we're living in an age where people have forgotten all about the commandment and the commandment that says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. And the people have totally passed that one by and forgotten it, and they don't pay any attention to the Sabbath at all. And I have people tell me, oh, Brother Cox, do you think that's important? I want to ask you something. Let's say that you came to me and uh, you taught me about Jesus Christ. And I accepted Christ as my personal Savior. And uh, a few days later, you're back visiting with me, and uh, you ask me, what do you do for a living? And I say, I steal chickens. And you say, you do what? I said, I steal chickens. And you say, well, why do you steal chickens? And I say, well, that's the way I make my living. That's the way I feed my family. That's the way I put something on the table. That's how I, I make a living in stealing chickens. Would you tell me I ought to quit? Huh? Yeah, you would tell me I ought to quit stealing chickens. It's not right. Why should I quit? Because it's one of the commandments. Well, what I'm trying to tell you tonight is so is the fourth one. It's one of the commandments of God. When he says, remember the Sabbath day, he means it. That's what makes it important. And the commandment that says, honor your father and your mother. If there's any one commandment that the American people are going to be brought into judgment over, it's this one. I can tell you that for sure. And the reason I say that is I visit too many old folks' homes where I find too many forgotten mothers and fathers. And I can tell you right now, the Lord will call you into judgment over it because that's one of the commandments. And the commandment that simply says, thou shalt not kill, and you can take a look at murders across the world. They have literally just continued to rise until today there is no appreciation for human life. You can go to parts of the world where life is very, very cheap and you can lose your life like that. And let me tell you, in some of our cities, it's that way. Cheap. Mankind has lost the value of life. And then the commandment that simply says, thou shalt not commit adultery. Boy, we have passed that one up. You know, they say, well, we're living in a new age. Uh, this is the time of new morality. We're living in the time of free love. Well, the new morality, all I've found it to be is old-fashioned immorality. That's all I've found it to be. You know, I, I grant that it's changing. You see, you can't take God's commandments and excuse the very vernacular expression, but you can't thumb your nose at God's commandments and get by with it, friend. I don't care who you are. You're not going to get by with it. And when they've done that to this commandment, we're, we're reaping the results of it now. You know, I can remember all the time through the years that I've held crusades, I've had a lot of people come in and, ask you to pray for them. But boy, it's only been in the last few years where I have people coming in, I mean, with tears running down their cheeks, pleading with you to pray with them because they've got AIDS. I mean, the whole thing has changed. We've taken that commandment and thrown it to the wind, and this is what's happened to us. You can just look at the rate of divorce in the world. And by the way, you can see where the United States is. It leads the whole pack simply because we've forgotten that commandment and we give every excuse in the world for getting a divorce. I mean, if a marriage has a little bit of trouble, the first thing we want to do is jump overboard rather than trying to solve the problem. And the commandment that simply says, thou shall not steal, I don't have enough time to go into all of them, folks. But just the question of stealing from your employer, do you have any idea of how much that runs into in a year in money? You know, it runs into the millions upon millions of dollars. 
where the employee is just simply taking something from his employer. And he said, oh, he's got plenty. He won't miss a little bit of it. Won't make much difference. Who told you it doesn't? What happened to your morality when you think you can take something that doesn't belong to you, that belongs to your employer, and stick it in your pocket and take it home? What's happened to us that we take God's commandments and treat them thus? I'm talking about what we're faced with today. This is a problem that we face. And the commandment that says, Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. There are literally people that make their living this way. That's right. They make their living off of bearing false witness. If you don't believe it, next time you visit your doctor, ask him what he has to pay for malpractice insurance. In just any way to get a dollar, bearing false witness. And the commandment that says, thou shall not covet. We are a nation of people that covet. In fact, if you just reached in and took all the advertising off TV that deals with coveting, it would take 50% of it off TV. You know what I'm talking about. You've seen Mr. Smith come driving his car into the driveway as Mr. Brown was trimming his hedge. You've seen those ads. All the concept of coveting, we use it time and time again, and God just simply says, don't covet. We've taken the commandments of God and thrown them away, and the Scripture says there would be a marked effort to do away with God's law in the last days. That's what it says, and he shall speak pompous words against the Most High, shall persecute the saints of the Most High, and shall intend to change times and what? Laws. It says that he, the Antichrist would make an effort to change the law of God. It even goes on and says here, we have not obeyed the voice of the Lord our God to walk in his laws which he set before us by his servants, the prophets. It says the people don't want to follow God's law. It even says the priest or the ministers will cause the people to stumble at God's law. But you have departed from the way. You have caused many to what? Stumble at the law. You have corrupted the covenant of Levi, saith the Lord of hosts. So they have endeavored to lead people contrary to God's law. And tonight, I want us to take a look at what the Scripture has to say about God's law because it's most important that we do. Romans 3, verse 20. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. For by the law is the what? Knowledge of sin. Now, let's get it clear tonight. God didn't give the law to save us. Don't go around trying to find salvation in God's law. That's not the purpose of it. The law was given to what? To point out sin. By the law is the knowledge of sin. That's what tells me what sin is. That's how you find out what sin is. The law isn't to save you. And some people want to try to take the law and find salvation by it. You can't. The sting of death is what? Sin, and the strength of sin is the law. You understand what that's saying? In other words, it's saying that the law is just as strong as the penalty. For instance, if the law doesn't require much of a penalty, then the law isn't very strong. See, I've been in some parts of the world where they have stoplights just like we do, but nobody stops for them. I've never been in such traffic jams in all my life. I mean, they just drive right on through them. They don't pay any attention to them. You know why? Because there's not much penalty to it. If you run one out here, you better believe they'll get you. They put a penalty on it. In other words, the law is just as strong as the penalty, and what kind of a penalty does God place on his law? What? Death. It says the wages of sin is death. If you break God's law, the penalty for that is death. That's what it says, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Jesus, Christ Jesus our Lord. So it tells us that the penalty for breaking God's law is death. Now, that law 
that we have. The scripture tells us that it was given to us for a purpose, but I find people taking God's law, today particularly, and throwing it away. They're saying, oh, you don't have to pay any attention to God's law. It doesn't make any difference, and they're trying to get rid of it. I want to show you what happens. It says here, therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. So the scripture tells us that God has a law, and we're going to put it up here. Okay, that's God's law. Now, let's take a look at another scripture. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. In Christ Jesus our Lord. So if you and I break God's law, that is called what? It's called sin. So let's put it up there. All right, let's look at another scripture. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So the scripture tells us that every one of us here have sinned, and because we all sin, we have a penalty of death upon us, and because we have a penalty of death on us, we need what? We need a Savior, that's right. So let's put a Savior up there. All right, let's look at another text. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came to the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. So Jesus Christ came, he died for me, I can find life in my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And the story about what Jesus did for me is called the what? It's called the gospel. Okay, that's the gospel. That's what Jesus Christ did for me. All right, let's see what happens. Let's go over here, and some of these people want to take the law, and they want to throw the law away. Say, get rid of it. You don't have to worry about the law. Well, let's look. Jeremiah says, And the Lord saith, Because they have forsaken my law, which I set before them, they have not obeyed my voice, neither walked in it. So the people said, Get rid of the law. So we're going to get rid of it. We're going to throw the law away. It's gone. We don't have any law anymore. It's gone, all right? Let's see what the Scripture says happens. Because the law brings about wrath. For where there is no law, there is no transgression. Okay, we threw away the law. So since I don't have a law, I don't have any what? No sin, so sin's gone. Got rid of that. All right, let's put up another text. And it says, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Well, but nevertheless, I did away with the law. And since there's no law, there is no sin. And since I don't have any sin, I don't need a Savior. So the Savior's gone. Let's put like another one. And it says, I marvel that you are turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel. But... We did away with the law. And since there's no law, I don't have any sin. And since I don't have any sin, I don't need a Savior. And since I don't need a Savior, there's no gospel, so it's gone. You know what you have left? Huh? I'll tell you what you got left. All you have left is a dumbfounded preacher without anything to say. That's what you got left. Anytime somebody tells you you can take the law and you can throw that law out, dear friend, if you could have done that, Christ would not have had to die. You can't monkey with that law. There's not anything wrong with it. This is what it says. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. Not anything wrong with God's law. Therefore, the law is holy, the commandment holy, just, and good. The problem's not with the law. You know where the problem is? Problem's with me. That's the problem. I'm the sinner, not the law. The law's fine. We know that the law is spiritual, but I'm carnal, sold under sin. There's where the problem is, not with the law. The problem's with you and I, and the law points its finger and says, Kenneth Cox, you're guilty. That's simply what it does. Listen. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? Huh? Certainly not. On the contrary, I would not have known sin except the law, except by the law, for I would not have known covetousness unless the law had said, you shall not covet. Paul said, there's not anything wrong with the law. It's not sin. It points out sin. It tells me what sin is. James gives you the perfect relationship of the law. Listen, 
Be ye doers of the word and not hearers only deceiving yourselves. Now he said, you know, don't just read it, folks. Listen to what it says and follow it. That's what he's saying, James is saying. If anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in the mirror. It says he goes into the bathroom, takes a look at himself, and he's got dirt on his face. That's what it's saying. For he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. Looks into the mirror, the mirror says, your face is dirty, and he walks out of the bathroom and doesn't bother to wash his face and soon forgets that he's got dirt on his face. That's what he's saying. Okay. But he who looks into the what? Perfect law of liberty, and that's the Ten Commandments. James will tell you clearly that it is. And is not a forgetful here, but a doer of the work. This one will be blessed in what he does. Now, what's James trying to tell us? He's trying to tell us this. You fellows here that have had a chance like I have to work on your car, I don't know if you have the problems that I do when I work on my car, but it seems that if I get my hands greasy and dirty, somehow it gets on my face. I don't know if you've any, ever had any problems that way or not, but I do. And so I go into the bathroom and I take a look in the mirror and it tells me my face is dirty. Now, the mirror never does much for me, see? So I don't like what I see. You know, I, di I just don't like what I'm seeing there. And so I go out in the garage and I get the screwdriver and I come in there and I take that mirror off the wall and I throw it in the trash. See, I get rid of that thing. Don't like it. Now, that's what some people do with God's law. They look into God's law and it says, you're a sinner. And they don't like it, and so they take it and throw it into the trash. Dear friend, when you look into the mirror, it tells you, you if your face is dirty, it says you need what? You need soap and water. That's what it's telling you. When you look into the law and it says you've got sin in your life, it tells you you need what? You need Jesus Christ. Now, dear friend, you don't find cleansing in the law. The law is not going to cleanse you. The law is going to condemn you. That's the purpose of the law. It's to point out sin. It's going to say you're guilty, you're wrong, you're a sinner. And when it tells me that, then I'm going to flee to Jesus Christ. And it says the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses me from all sin. And boy, I can stand now in front of the law clean because of what Jesus Christ has done for me. Don't attack the law. Don't get after God's law. It's not the problem. The problem is that you and I need to run to Jesus Christ. There's where I find cleansing. That's what makes the difference. We need to get it clear what's involved here. You see, that law demands two things, and I've got to hurry. I've got a lot of ground to cover here tonight, but that law demands two things of you. One, if you break it, it demands what? It demands a penalty. It says if you break it, you're going to pay a penalty, and the penalty for that is debt. The other thing the law demands from you is perfection. The law won't settle for anything less than perfection. You and I aren't perfect. That's why Jesus came and lived a perfect life. Now, when it demands perfection, maybe you don't understand that. Let me give you an example. You remember when Jesus said this? You have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not commit adultery. And you say, well, <laughs> I've never done that. Never have committed adultery. I'm all right there. Listen. But I say to you that whoever looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. That just made us a room full of adulterers. You see, different story between, much difference between the letter and the spirit. You see, I can keep the letter of the law by willpower alone. I can just stiffen my old backbone and say, I'm not going to do it and keep the letter of the law. But I can tell you there is no willpower on the face of the earth that can keep the spirit of the law. That is kept only in Christ Jesus. You can keep the letter of the law and not keep the spirit of the law. But you cannot keep the spirit of the law and not keep the letter. Impossible. 
So I can tell you right now, that's the reason you, and that's the reason that I need the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I run on some people who want to try to get to heaven some other way. It says, For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse, for it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not continue. How much? In all things which are written in the book of the law and do them. Now, if you're going to get to heaven by some other method than through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, then the only way you can do it is you've got to keep this law perfectly. And you've got to keep it perfectly from the day you were born. And if you haven't done that, you better forget trying to be saved that way. Because it simply says, for whoever shall keep the whole law and yet stumble, what? One point is guilty of all, and I find a lot of Christian people in churches that remind me of ivory soap. That's what they remind me of. You see, they happen to be 99 and 44 one-hundredths percent pure, but that's not good enough. You can be 99 and 44 one-hundredths percent and be lost. Get it clear. The law demands 100%, and Jesus Christ is the one that gave 100% for it. He met every demand that the law required. He met for you, and the only hope you have is in Jesus Christ. And don't misunderstand what I'm saying tonight. Just because I accept the Lord Jesus Christ as my personal Savior and I accept His grace, that doesn't give me a right to be rebellious. I have to be surrendered. I have to be willing to follow. He said, if you love me, keep my commandments. He said, follow me, walk as I walk. That's what he's trying to tell us. Romans 3.10 says, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. None of us are righteous. We have no righteousness of our own, only in Christ Jesus. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in what? All points tempted as we are yet without sin. He lived an absolute perfect life. He never sinned one time, not even so much as in thought. He lived an absolute perfect life for you and me. Now, please follow me very carefully because the next few moments I'm going to share with something with you that changed my whole understanding and made a great, great difference in my own personal life. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by what? Faith in what? In Jesus Christ. I have faith in what he did for me. I am justified based on what Christ did for me apart from the deeds of the law. The law is going to point out my sin. The law is going to say, you're guilty, Kenneth Cox. And only as I flee to Christ, only then can I be justified. Now listen. Therefore, as by one man's offense... Judgment came to all men. Who was that? Now, by Adam. By Adam's offense, judgment came to all men, resulting in condemnation. Even so, by one man's righteous act, who was that? Jesus Christ. The what? The free gift came to all men, resulting in justification of life. Because of what Jesus Christ did, I by faith can reach out and accept that and be justified. Now listen, this very next text most people can't accept. And you need by faith to reach out and accept it. For as by one man's disobedience, Adam's disobedience, many were made sinners, so also by one man's obedience, that one man being who? Jesus Christ, many will be made righteous. Therefore, you are made righteous by what? By his obedience. Did you get that? You're made righteous by his obedience. He lived a perfect life. He did it for you. Therefore, all you have to do is reach out and accept that. And when we do that, it makes a great difference. Do we make void the law through faith? No. No. 
just because I'm reaching out in faith and I'm accepting what the Lord Jesus Christ has done for me, I accept that he died for me, I accept that he lived a perfect life for me, that doesn't do away with the law. That doesn't lessen the law in one aspect. In fact, that only enhances the law. Do we make void the law through faith? Certainly not. On the contrary, we establish the law. Don't get after the law, friend. You go to Christ. When I became a Christian, I had kind of a rough time because I saw my need of Christ and I went to Christ and accepted him. But then I'd read texts like this. If you love me, keep my commandments. And I said, Lord, I love you. But those commandments and I don't get along. Every time I get around them, they're pointing their finger at me and saying, you're guilty. And we just aren't on very good terms, Lord. And then I'd read another text. And it would say this. I delight to do your will, O oh my God. Yea, your law is within my heart. And I said, Lord... I really don't mind doing your will. I'd like to do your will. But this thing about your law being in my heart, we aren't on good terms. That's just the truth of it. We just aren't on very good terms. And then I'd read another text like this. This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law into their hearts and in their minds I will write them. And I said, Lord, I don't understand. I love you. I understand my need of a Savior. I understand I'm a sinner. I understand that I desperately need you, but this thing about the law, I don't understand. And then one day it dawned. One day I understood that I wasn't made righteous by my obedience. I was made righteous by his obedience. And you know, my relationship with the law changed completely. Instead of that law pointing its finger at me, I said, Lord, the more your law demands, the greater is my salvation. Because Jesus had done it all. He kept it perfectly for me. Therefore, I have salvation in him. And no longer were the, was the law and I on opposite ground. I could say, okay, Lord, write your law on my heart. Put it in my mind. I'll gladly keep it because we weren't enemies anymore because I understood that I was made righteous by Jesus Christ. Changed it completely. I pastored a little church in New Mexico. In that church was a family. Uh, they had a boy, a red-headed, freckle-faced boy by the name of Dan probably the wildest human being I have ever known in my life. I really don't know what was wrong with Dan. I believe he was born wrong or something. Uh, he, he just was one of these people that seemed to be bent on getting into trouble. I mean, all the time, constantly into trouble. His folks would send him off to school. He didn't go, ditch school. I can remember them sending out the truant officer out to the house and said, why don't you folks send Dan to school? And they said, what do you mean? We send him every morning. And they said, well, he never gets there. You know, I have talked to him until I was blue in the face. Teachers talked to him until they were blue in the face. His parents did. Nobody seemed to get anywhere with Dan. And then he got to the age where his parents made a terrible mistake. A lot of parents do. They bought him a car. You know, and Dan was bad to begin with. Now he was uncontrollable. I mean, he was constantly in trouble. Now, don't misunderstand me about Dan. Dan was redheaded, freckled face, but he had a personality. He could wrap you around his finger and nothing flat. And he would get in that car and drive downtown and turn it around and around right in the middle of that little town just to get the police to chase him. I mean... He was in trouble all the time until finally, and, and I must tell you that the police liked him. I mean, he just had that kind of a personality. But he had been in so much trouble that they finally had to arrest him. 
And they brought him in before Judge Brown, and Judge Brown read all the charges against Dan, and he said, Dan, I'm going to have to send you away to reformatory. Now, you're going to have to understand, Dan didn't go to school very much, but that doesn't mean that he was dumb. You know, I run onto some pseudo-intellectuals that think if you don't go to school that that makes you dumb. You know, that's what they accuse Christ of also. Well, Dan wasn't dumb. He usually was about three steps ahead of you. And so he turned to the judge and says, Judge, uh, you know, my parents go to a church and they have some schools that are called academies. And he said, those things are just like reformatories. Why don't you send me to one of those? And uh, the judge, not knowing anything, turned to the parents and said, uh, is this true? And they said, no, it's not. And Dan said, oh, yes, it is. He said, they have a men's dormitory. They have a women's dormitory. He said, in fact, you have to check in every night. They turn the lights out, and they even have a monitor that checks the rooms. And the judge turned to the parents and said, well, do you have any objection to Dan going? And they said, not if you can get him in. <laughs> so the judge said, well, call the principal up. So they did, and the judge got on the phone, and he talked to the principal. And uh, I don't know what the judge said to him, but that principal agreed to let Dan go to Sandy View Academy in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Now, Dan didn't want to go to Sandy View Academy, folks. He just didn't want to go to the reformatory. So when he got to Sandy View Academy, Dan hadn't changed. I mean, he hadn't changed at all. So it, when the lights went out at night, Dan went out the window, you know? And he would go downtown and get into all kinds of trouble, would get drunk, would come back and get in fights. And they did all kinds of things. And one night, Dan slipped out, went into town, got to drinking, stowed a car, and got arrested. Dean had to go in and check him out, get him out of the jail. The next morning, the principal called him in and said, Dan, we can't keep you. You don't want to be here. You don't want to abide by any of the regulations here. We just can't keep you. We're going to have to send you home. And Dan said, I understand. And then Dan made a request that I don't understand why the principal ever agreed to that. But he said, don't call my parents. He said, just let me go home. And he said, in two or three days, write him a letter and tell him I can't come back. Why the principal agreed to that, I don't know. But Dan went home and got home. His parents said, what are you doing home, Dan? And Dan said, oh, we got two or three days off at school. And they said, well, fine, we're happy to have you, Dan. And so Dan stayed around there a few days, and one morning Dan was home, and his mother was home, and the mailman came. And here was a letter from the principal. Dan's mother took the letter and walked into the living room and sat down in the rocking chair and took the letter, opened the letter, and began to read it. And there the principal had listed all the things that Dan had done and said, we can't have Dan come back. And when she finished reading the letter, she said, oh, Dan, oh, Dan, oh, Dan, and fell over dead. Dan ran into the room trying to do something, but couldn't do anything, and he fell down on his knees. Then he said, God, give me back my mother. I'll do anything, whatever you want me to do. Just give me back my mother. But she was dead. And when the funeral was over, Dan now wasn't mischievous. Dan was bitter had no appreciation for his life or anybody else's. I mean, he would walk into a bar and take a beer bottle and break it on the counter, and if you looked at him wrong, he'd start in on you. He had no appreciation for his life. And he got into so much trouble again that they arrested him and brought him in before Judge Brown. Jay read off all of his charges, and Judge said, Dan, I can't send you to reformatory now. I've got to send you to the penitentiary. Again, Dan's mind was working. And he said, Judge, do you think there's any possibility that I might get in the armed forces? And the judge said, they won't have you, Dan. He said, would you try? 
And so the judge called up the recruiters and they came down and one after another came in and listened and they said, yeah, let us have him. We'll make a man out of him. And Dan said, let's try, let's try the next branch of service. They went through about four branches of service before somebody had enough sense not to say that. And one of the recruiters said, I don't know if we can help him, but we'd be happy to try if he wants to join. And Dan said, let's go. Now, Dan went away to service not wanting to go into the service, not wanting to go penitentiary. So Dan, there's no change in Dan. He was as bad as he had ever been. He spent most of his time in the brig, drunk. I don't know what happened, folks. I just know that Dan got out of the armed services in two years with an honorable discharge, and how he did that, I don't understand. But he came back to that little town of Clayton, New Mexico, and the whole town shuddered. Dan was as bad as he had ever been. In five years, he totaled 17 cars. I've had the police get me out of bed many times, take me for a ride out there down the road, and here would be a place where the car had gone off the road and through the fence and turned over three or four times, and we would go out in the field and pull three people out of that car, two of them dead and one alive, and the one would be Dan, and I've said many a time, why, Lord, why? In this little church, pastor was a couple oh they didn't uh, they just took a liking to Dan for some reason they didn't preach to them they just invited him over to eat with them and they would feed him ever so often and Dan came to the place that he loved that couple I mean he loved them in a special way and they said to him Dan how about going to camp meeting with us there was going to be a camp meeting in Oklahoma City and Dan knew what camp meetings were camp meetings is where people come together and stay together about a week and they live in tents and trailers and stuff and Dan said not on your life <laughs> said I'm not going to camp meet and they said come on Dan go with us." And he said no way and they said won't you go with us just one night and Dan said yeah I'll go with you one night on Saturday night they said great now Dan didn't intend to go what Dan intended to do is drive down to Oklahoma City, drive out to the campgrounds, see all the buildings and stuff, and then he intended to get in his car and go find one of his army buddies that lived in Oklahoma City and go out drinking. That's what Dan intended to do. Drives down to Oklahoma City, drives out to the campgrounds, pulls the car over to the side of the road and gets out to look the buildings over so he can tell his friends that he came, he just couldn't find them and looked across the road, and there stood his friends. So Dan couldn't get out of going. So they took him to the meeting that night, sat on the second row from the front. The preacher preached a rather simple sermon and made an appeal for people to give their hearts to the Lord. And the Holy Spirit got hold of Dan's heart, and he gave his heart to the Lord that night. Now, when Dan gave his heart to the Lord, he became as zealous for the Lord as he had been for the devil came back to Clayton, New Mexico, bound and determined that he was going to convert all of his drinking buddies. And his drinking buddies were about as interested as Dan had been. Among his drinking buddies was a close friend by the name of Mitch. And every time Dan would get around him, he would try to study the Bible with them, but uh, they would always, they liked Dan, but they would always put him off or make an appointment and then they wouldn't show. And Dan went out to study the Bible with Mitch and Mitch wasn't there. Dan wasn't dumb. He knew where Mitch was. Drove down to the wagon wheel tavern. There Mitch was, sitting in a booth with a girl. Dan went in and sat down. Mitch said, what are you doing in here? And Dan said, I came to have that Bible study with you. And Mitch said, in here, and Dan said, in here. Now, by this time, Dan hasn't gone to school. Mitch has finished college. He begins to ask Dan some questions that Dan can't answer. And my phone rings about 3 o'clock in the morning. Dan said, I'm down here in the wagon wheel. I need some help. Would you come help me? I went down to the wagon wheel. I'll never forget it. I walked into that bar and people were dancing. The jukebox was playing. I don't know what happened. In five minutes... That jukebox had gone off and everybody had gone except Dan, 
the bartender, and Mitch and I. And we had a Bible study. I can remember pleading with Mitch to give his heart to the Lord. He never would. Oh, folks, that's been 18, 19 years ago now. About 12 years ago, Dan called me on the phone. He was a pastor in Denver, Colorado. And he said, I just wanted to tell you that Mitch came to church today and gave his heart to the Lord. Said he never could, could forget what Christ had done for him. Tonight, Dan does the same work I do. He holds evangelistic crusades all across North America. You see, the grace of God is more than capable, friend. Doesn't make any difference what you've been or where you've been. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, tonight, we thank you so much for Jesus, for all that he's done for each one of us. Tonight, while our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed, I'm going to ask those here tonight who would like to reach out and accept Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. Tonight, you would like to accept him as your personal Savior. I'm going to ask you to get up from wherever you're seated and come down here to the front. There also may be some of you who have accepted Christ that you would like to follow him in baptism. I'm going to ask you also to get out of your seat and come. There may be some of you who have accepted Christ, you've been baptized, but you've learned things that you didn't know before. And you would like to keep the Sabbath. You would like to become part of the church. I'm going to ask you also to get up, make your way down front here tonight. Those of you in the fellowship room, I'm going to ask you also to get up from wherever you're seated and make your way to the front in there. Simply as we pray, just step out from wherever you're seated and make your way tonight. As men and women are coming, won't you make that decision tonight? If you would like to accept Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, or you need to step out and be baptized, or maybe you've done both and you just need to become part of the family of God, part of His church, I'm going to ask you just to step out from wherever you're seated and come tonight. As the Holy Spirit speaks to your heart, make your way tonight. speaking to you as we just pray won't you make that decision don't put it off friend step out and say by the grace of God tonight I'm going to settle that oh you may be one of these individuals that didn't think there was any hope for you but let me tell you something there is hope for you God loves you you may be one of these individuals that's been coming to church for a good while and never followed your Lord in baptism and tonight you need to make that decision Step out and make that decision. Or you may just need to become part of the family of God. I'm just going to continue to pray. I'm going to ask you to continue to pray. And as the Holy Spirit speaks to your heart, I'm going to ask you just to step out and make your way tonight. of you in the fellowship room I'd also like to appeal to you that you give your heart to the Lord tonight accept Christ as your personal Savior follow him in baptism There's someone there front help you just step out and make your way tonight 
Now, I just want to tell you, I don't believe in long appeals. And I'm not going to be making a long appeal. I'm going to close it here very quickly now. And so if you need to make that decision, I plead with you, make it now. Don't wait. Say, yes, Lord. Step out. Make your way tonight. I'm going to ask Donna just to play a moment longer. I'm going to give the Holy Spirit a little more time to speak to you. And as he does, come. Come tonight. I simply close this invitation in prayer and as the Holy Spirit speaks to you that still small voice then just step out from wherever you're seated and make your way tonight Heavenly Father we're so thankful tonight for the grace of Jesus Christ for, it, for his love and his care over us, that we can come to you and find that all of our sins have been washed away, that we can be clean, that we can have a new life. We're thankful for each one that have made their way tonight. Oh, Lord, be very close to them. May they understand that in you they have a friend that sticketh closer than a brother, that in thee all things are possible, that they can just reach out and take hold of your hand and find everything that they need to be victorious. Bless them in a very special way tonight as they start this new life in Christ. Bless each one here. For this we ask in Christ's name. Amen.